just trying to take everything in that I had just witnessed. And um, I, had, I, I just wanted to be alone. I didn't want to be bothered. And then Kaylee, um, when she got home from work, she was like knocking on my door and screaming like, Hey, we have to, we're, we're going to go out and eat. We have to make it look normal. You know, like part of the, part of her plan to try to make it look normal, like make everything look normal, like nothing ever happened. And so um, when, when she told me that, I screamed at her, leave me the fuck alone. That's what I told her. And then that's when she texted me, why, why are you screaming at me? And so um, after that, we, um, I was in my room till like 7.30. I was just laying in there, trying to process everything in. Um, you know, we had a dead body in the apartment. That's the thing that's been going through my mind all day that day. And um, so I woke up at 7.30. Well, I didn't wake, I was awake, but I got up from my bed at around 7.30, 8. And then um, I proceeded to go with her plan to go um, to go to the, um, to go out to eat. And then um, I told her that I told my mom that I was not feeling well, that I had a sore throat. And so then she was like, well, we have to support your story. So after we finished that guy, we went to the CVS on Hillsborough Street. And we bu I bought um, uh, Terraflu gel pills. And I never took any because I was really not sick. I was just sick of the fact that I witnessed a, a murder um, right in front of my eyes. And um, what I did was I grabbed some of the uh, gel pills. And I took them out of the uh, out of the plastic container, and I just flushed them flushed them down the toilet just to make it look that I actually um, took um, medication and to make it look that I was actually sick. So you all just okay. And so you all just left Christina's dead body in her room when you all went to Bad Daddy's. Yes, we did. And when we were to Bad Daddy's, it's like it was the most quietest supper. I ever had, like I was just sitting there, I just on my phone, I couldn't even talk, I couldn't even, and it's one of my biggest regrets to this day, not being able to call 911, not calling 911, but I was just trying to, I was in fear, you know, she had threatened to hurt my family, and you know, I had just witnessed her do this brutal murder, so I don't know what else she's capable of, and with the people that she hangs around with, um, you know, I don't know if, if they, if, if they already came up with like another plan, I have no idea what went, people, like what else is behind the scene. I just know what I saw and what I heard and what I witnessed. Is that why you took her threat seriously? I took it very, very seriously because I know that she beat up her own mother, uh, you know, to the ground. I know that she, you know, is violent towards um, other people. Like when we went to the Waffle House, she was like cursing at them, you know, trying to um, show violence. And you know, I witnessed the brutal murder of Christina. So if she if she does all these things to all these people, what makes me think that she won't do something to my family? And so that's the one thing that has is going through my head even till this day. Why didn't you call nine one one when she got to a safe location? Again, because I had the threat over me, and that's all I could think of. Uh, Christina could no longer be hurt no more. She had already died. Um, I was the only one who had the key in my possession, so I know Kaylee can't go in there and mess with her anymore. And I know my and, and my family is still living, so I know that she can probably still be able to, you know, do something to them. So that's why I didn't, you know, call nine one one. I was just still trying to recover from what I had just witnessed. I was just trying to put everything together, and I was in one of the most awful situations I could ever be in. I regret not calling 911. I wish I would have. It was, it was, it was it, even to, to this day, it still affects me a lot. So after Bad Daddies, what did you and Kaylee do? So after Bad Daddies, we went to the CVS, and I had mentioned that's where we bought the the cold Terraflu gel pills to support my theory that I was having a sore throat, I wasn't feeling well. And then after that, we went back to the apartment. We sat down in the living room for like five, ten minutes. We really didn't say much. She just told me um, to just make sure, remember 9 a.m. And, and remember, don't, don't call the police or nothing or else I'm going to hurt your family. She kept on threatening me um, that she was going to hurt my family. So that's why I didn't, um, I didn't call 911 at all whatsoever. And time had already passed by and I had already tried to attempt to clean up. So I knew I was, I had already broken the law. So I knew um, I would be, um, you know, getting in trouble for that. 
What did you all do after Bad Daddy's and the drugstore? After the drugstore, what did you do? Again, I um, we got to the apartment and we only spoke for like five ten minutes in the living room. You know, again, she did say, "Remember to say nine a.m." and if you don't, and if you try to call the cops, she threatened me um, to hurt my family. So after that, I just went into my um, I just went to my bedroom. She went her way, and I fell asleep. And that is the last time I ever saw Kaylee face to face. So moving on to Sunday, April fourth. What did you do on Sunday, April 4th? So Sunday, April 4th, I woke up at like around, well, I woke up through a call. I think Kaylee called me because I remember FaceTiming her that morning. I remember her walking in towards the, the um, and her work. We um, Part of the, um, the plan was to also have regular conversation. Like, let's not act out of character or nothing. So we were just like texting normal like nothing ever happened. We FaceTimed like nothing ever happened, you know, just like just to show me that, you know, she was at work now and I and then I had told her that I was gonna go spend the day with my parents in Clayton and then I, and then from Clayton I was gonna make my commute to Sanford to go to work. And so did you go to work? No, I did not. Eventually did you start getting some calls from some people when you were in Clayton? Yes I did. So um, as I was getting ready, so my shift started starts at eight PM at the yard plant. And so from Clayton to Sanford, it's a one hour, 15 minute commute. So I was getting ready, putting my shoes on like around six. I wanted to leave a little early because the traffic can be very hectic, especially on 40 where they was doing construction at the time. Um, and so as I was putting my shoes on, I was fixing to leave the house. My mom had packed my lunch for me and she had um, made my lunchbox and everything. And so um, I received this one phone call from this Virginia phone number. Um, and so in my mind, I'm thinking that it's like from school because I'm a, I'm a student at Liberty University Online, which is a university that's located in Lynchburg, Virginia. And so I thought it was a call from the university, I don't know, so I just answered the phone. And I was shocked to hear that it was um, uh, Abraham speaking through that, um, through that line. What kinds of things were they asking you? They were asking me like, um, uh, hey, uh, you know, I just want to let you know that we reported Christina missing. Um, you know, we haven't heard from her in like, um, in like a day. You know, have you heard from her or anything like that? And then I just pretended to say, no, I haven't heard from Christina at all. Um, let me attempt to try to make um, like a phone call, try to get in contact with her, but I never did. And so after that, um, the brother, um, they hung up. Well, before they hung up, they said, if you hear anything of Christina, please let us know. And I said, yes, I will update you on anything that I, that I hear or know. But I already knew that she was dead, so I knew she wasn't going to hear from her no more. And, um, and then they called me again the second time through a 919 number. This is a different phone number. These are phone numbers that I did not have saved on my phone. Um, and so when they called me through that 919 number, um, Abraham, uh, 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 his mom, Miss Yolanda, and um, the friend Jordan, um, they were inside the apartment and, and Abraham asked me, hey, can you tell me which one is um, Christina's bedroom? I know exactly where the bedrooms are. I know where A, B, C, and bedroom D is. I did not want them to look at her dead body. I did not want them to witness what I witnessed. I didn't want them to see it. I wanted to save them that, that you know, that awful scene. So I lied to them. I told them it's bedroom A which is Kaylee's bedroom. And so um, once and then um, once I arrived to Raleigh, I let them know that I was gonna make my way to Raleigh. And so from Clayton on my way to Raleigh, um, I called out from work and then I made my way. And then once I arrived, I parked my car at the Marriott parking lot um, because um, Signature Parking Garage, um, it, it only has limited parking space. So um, Signature Apartments, they have a deal with the Marriott in the parking lot, and so um, where students can park there, there's just so many students and not enough parking in the parking garage. So the parking space have an S on it, on the Marriott parking spot, so that, that, that S is for signature. And so I, that's where I parked. And so once I parked there, I saw Jordan. Well, when I arrived, I didn't know who Jordan was, but now that I know who Jordan is, Jordan was in her Mercedes, and then Abraham and Miss Yolanda, um, Christina's mom, they were um, standing right there like in the sidewalk. And so as I got out of the car, I told them, 
hi, I'm Eric, you know, I'm the one who you guys called. And then Abraham, like, talked to him aside. He was like, yeah, um, about that bedroom, you gave me the wrong bedroom. You gave me bedroom A. Um, you gave me a bedroom that's not Haley, I mean, that's not Christina's. And then I was like, really? Uh, I thought I gave you the right bedroom. And they're like, no, that's not Christina's stuff. But again, I didn't want them to see her body laying there dead. I didn't want them to see anything at all. So I lied to them and I told them that I, that Christina's bedroom was A when it wasn't, it was bedroom D. And so when I arrived there, I still had the, um, I still had the gloves, the bloody gloves. I had them hidden under my pajama pants. So in my bedroom, I had like a cube dresser, like a cube kind of cubby thing that I bought at Target. And then I bought like little cube, like, Slits that you can just put in there. I don't know how to explain it. And then um, that's and one of those is where I neatly put my pajama pants. And so I hid the bloody gloves under the pajama pants. And um, and so when I arrived there, I told them I'm gonna use the restroom um for a second. I'll be right back out. Really, I didn't use the bathroom. I just went in. I threw away the dirty gloves. Um, I threw away Christina's phone on the second trash bag. And then um, I tied it up and I took out the trash the second time. And um, that's where I threw it in the shoe, and then I put a clean, brand new um, trash bag in the kitchen trash bin. And so that's when I made my way back outside, and we were just having small talk. Um, me between me and Miss Yolanda, we were having small talk. We were speaking Spanish, and then Abraham, I spoke to him too, and and, and Jordan, and um, and so we were just waiting for the police to arrive. Um, the first officer didn't arrive until after 30 minutes after I had arrived. So I arrived. And then the police didn't get there until like 30 or 40 minutes later. And so once the first officer arrived, Jordan and Abraham, we were making our way towards the signature apartments because we were waiting for the police at the Marriott parking lot. So we were on the sidewalk and we went towards the signature apartments. And um, Jordan and Abraham, they were ahead. And I was with Ms. Yolanda in the back. And then Ms. Yolanda asked me a question, do you think Kaylee would have killed my daughter? And so, um, when she asked me that question, I wanted to say yes so bad, but I just couldn't because I was just not in my right mind. I had the, I had the threat hanging over my shoulder, and, and it, it was just, I don't know, I don't even know how to explain how, what, what, what I was thinking then. I was just not there. Going back a little bit, um, you mentioned something about getting Christina's keys earlier. Do you remember that? Yes. What did you end up doing with those keys? So when they called me, um, when they called me and before I left um, Clayton to meet them at the signature apartments to meet with the authorities, um, her car keys and the whole keychain, I threw it away in my parents' garbage bin, and then I took the trash and then I took the trash out of my parents' house and threw it in their dumpster. So we live in a neighborhood, so we don't have like an actual dumpster. It's one of those rolling things that you like. Put in like in the, in the end of your driveway, and the truck comes and gets it. Um, and so I put the trash in there, and then the truck came. The trash truck comes Mondays early, like around five in the morning, five thirty in the morning. So um, that's where I put those car keys, and then I took out her bedroom key. And her bedroom key, to this day, it's under my parents' house. Um, I can't even draw the blueprint um, to show you where um, where that key is. It's under. Um, it's, it's, it's under my parents' house hidden. I know exactly where it is. So moving on to sort of your interactions at the police station, did the police show up at Signature Apartments? Yes, they did. Did they ask you to come to the station with them? Yes, uh, no. So the, um, so the way it, it started is um, me, Ms. Yolanda, um, Abraham, and Jordan, we were sitting in the front of the apartment complex. We were like right there, you know, just waiting to be questioned by the police and everything. And then um, I received a phone call from Adeline Polich, um, uh, one of Christina's friends that they had a, a um, they got an argument about a month ago because she was bringing some guys over or something like that. And then um, her and Abby, when they had called me, um, they said, hey, we're on our way to the signature promise to meet up with y'all. And so then I, I was like, okay, cool, we'll be here waiting for you. And then when I hung up, I let Miss Yolanda know and Abraham know, hey, Addie just called me. Um, they said they were going to be on their way. And then Jordan was like, no, you need to call them back and tell them not to come because this is not a party. 
this is nothing, you know, this is not a social event. So I call him back and I tell him, hey, the friend and the family just told me to call you back and let you know not to come meet us here. Don't come to the apartment at all whatsoever. And they were like, okay. Like the reaction was like, okay. And so um, shortly after, um, it was getting chilly at night. So I asked for a jacket and I told him that it's up in my apartment. And so one of the police officers, he walked with me up to my apartment with my door open and I grabbed the jacket, he saw me grab it. I grabbed my North Face jacket that you saw on, on the interview video. I grabbed that and I took it with me downstairs. And then after we got out, one of the officers said, all right, we're gonna start taking each one of y'all at the station. It's starting to get a little chilly and it's a little late. And then, um, we, and then they said, do we have any volunteers? And so I volunteered to go first. So um, I got up and then um, he was like, okay, cool, come on. And so um, I was never handcuffed or anything like that. I cooperatively, willfully, willingly went um, to the police station. Um, he patted me down to make sure I didn't have any weapons, the officer, and then I got into the RPD car in the back, and then I was driven to um, the homicide place on, off Capitol Boulevard. I don't know the exact road, Green's Dairy Place, I think. Yeah. So, did you end up going into an interview room with Detective O'Neill? Yes, I did. I ended up going into an interview room with Detective O'Neill. Did you tell him a lot of lies? I did. I told him a lot of lies and I told him a lot of truths too. So it's fair to say that you told him a number of lies? Yes. Are you telling the truth now? Yes, I am. You lied to Detective O'Neill about the last time? Did you lie to Detective O'Neill about the last time you saw Christina? Yes, I did. The la um, I told him that the last time I saw Christina was on Tuesday when Christina and Kaylee were fighting over the thermostat. That's when I told him the last time I saw Christina, but really the last time I saw Christina was that Saturday morning when um, when she knocked on my door to use the bathroom. Um, and then when, when I wished her a happy birthday, happy late birthday, and I told her that, that I loved her and everything, um, that was the last time I truly saw Christina. Did you lie to Detective O'Neill about being sick? Yes, I did. I lied to Detective O'Neill about being sick. Did you tell the truth about your feelings for Christina? Yes and no. Um, so when I first started the interview, um, they didn't know that it was a fraudulent marriage. So when he asked me, you know, like, do you love her and stuff like that? I pretended and said yes. But later on, like, I do love her, but like as my best friend, I love her as my friend. Um, but not nothing intimate, nothing like that. Because again, like I said before, I'm gay. I, I like men, so I'm not into like Christina or in any sexual nature at all whatsoever. Um, but later on in the interview, I slowly like started admitting, you know, that um, you know it, it is a fraudulent marriage, and slowly, kind of like almost like not saying it fully, but like you know, like the second one, he was asking me questions, so. This doesn't sound like an intimate marriage. Is this more like a convenience for you? And so that's when I started like, you know, yes, it, it was a convenience for just citizenship. And so that's when I wanted to start telling, like that's when I started telling the truth. Can you please slow down? Yeah, sorry. <coughs> did you tell Detective O'Neill the last time you saw, what, what time did you tell Detective O'Neill was the last time you had seen Christina Saturday morning? I told her the last time I saw Christina Saturday morning was at 9 a.m. And the only reason I said 9 a.m. was because um, Kaylee and I had agreed to say 9 a.m. But truly, it was at 6 a.m. Did Detective O'Neill give you a chance to come forward and express Kaylee's guilt? Yes, he did. And it is one of my biggest regrets that i made in my life not to say the truth, and I wish I would have said the truth in the beginning. And like I said earlier, if I would have said the truth and I would have fully cooperated, I wouldn't find myself in the position that I am currently in now. Um, and yeah. What did you tell Detective O'Neill about Kaylee, about her personality? I told her that she's a little um, princess with like, I, I don't remember how I said it. She's like a little, Princess, charming little princess, something like that, but with an explosive attitude. Did you describe her as a liar to Detective O'Neill? I did. Did you tell Detective O'Neill anything about the muffin situation? Yes, I did. I let him know about the muffin situation. And what was that? 
Hmm? What was the muffin situation? Um, the muffin situation was when um, after the murder and after I had showered, um, this after we had talked the first time and I confronted her and, you know, I had already showered, Kaylee had, had already showered, um, I told him that Kaylee had gotten out of the shower because she did. When she knocked on my door with the muffin being complaining, complaining and saying, quote, oh, this bitch ate my muffin, um, she was in her, in her bath towel when she knocked on my door. Um, so that's how I know that she had gotten out of the shower because she was like in a bath towel naked, like, in the inside. And so, um, that's when, and I told him, you know, uh, Kaylee, um, has a note in her muffin bin saying, Kaylee's property do not touch. And so Kaylee got mad that Christina had gotten one of the muffins and, and then I explained to Detective O'Neill that um, Kaylee grabbed the muffin bin and threw it at Christina's door and then I later on ended up picking it up and throwing it in the, in the trash can and it was along with one of the trash bags that I had thrown out. This is backing up a little bit, but describe to us again where you and Kaylee were standing right after the murder. Yes, so... I don't know, I, uh, I mean, I would have like a, like a blueprint of the apartment. I can explain that a lot better. Your Honor, would it be possible to publish State's Exhibit 33 to the jury? That's the layout of the apartment. Any objection? No. Any objection? No. All right, you may publish State's Exhibit 33. Um, Hold on one second. Okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. Approach the witness, Your Honor. Yeah. All right. Can you zoom in a little bit? I can't very really see it that well. Um, that would kind of like frustrate me and like made me a little bit annoyed 
because um, at the time when we were sharing the same room, um, you know, we were sleeping in the same bed, so I, I kind of felt uncomfortable having a naked guy, you know, sleep in my bed while, you know, she's performing her business with her clientele. Did that make you want to kill her? No, absolutely not. So you're at the police station and you're talking to Detective O'Neill. How are you feeling at this point? I am having all kinds of emotions. I was not thinking right. I um, I mean, the murder just happened the day before, so I was still trying to process everything in. I was not in my right mind. I wasn't thinking straight. I was in fear, I was scared, I was sad. I, I didn't know what to do at that point, so I just went with Kaylee's plan. Just try to act normal and try to cover it up and, you know, just don't say what actually happened. How did you feel lying for Kaylee? I felt super awful because I knew that as a spouse, um, I would be the first, um, the first um, suspect. I was the first suspect, and even Christina's mom told me, hey, the police might want to, when we were making our way to signature, she was up, she told me in Spanish, you might want to, um, you know, just be ready because, um, you know, since you're the husband, they're going to come at you first and ask you questions. So um, I already knew that, and so I felt awful lying um, for Kayla like that. I wish I would have said something, and if I would have said something, maybe, like I said before, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm currently in today. How did you feel lying to Christina's family? I felt super awful lying to Christina's family, and I just wanted to let them know they're looking right in front of me. I'm so sorry for lying in front, of, in front of you. I never hurt your daughter. I will never put a hand on her. I was not the one who did it. That was Kaylee who did it. Um, I just want you to know that I was really good friends with her, and I am speaking genuinely from the bottom of my heart that I really am truly sorry, and I'm sorry to my family too because I put them through this mess too, and it has been really hard on, on both ends. Um, and so um, I just want you to know that I really okay, truly am sorry. Sustained. Sustained. Moving on, how did you feel when Detective O'Neill told you Christina was dead? I felt super sad, relieved. I felt relieved that, you know, he had told me that she was dead because it was like I didn't want that to come out of my mouth. You know, so I, I was like kind of relieved that, you know, he had told me, yeah, Christina had passed away. You know, I I tried to tell the truth in, in that interview room. And so it was really hard me trying to go off the script. It was really hard for me not to tell the truth. It took everything in me not to say anything to him. So moving on to post-interrogation, post after you talked to Detective O'Neill, did they have a vigil for Christina, for a ceremony? Yes, they did. They had a vigil for Christina on the night of April 6th, which was on Tuesday of 2021. Did you go? Yes, I did. I went, um, uh, a mutual friend of Christina's, um, you know, I, I, I kind of did talk to her too. Her name is Najia. Um, she went to go pick me up at my house because um, after I had left the, inter um, the homicide unit, um, last minute, the detective told me that they had to search my vehicle, and I willingly gave my keys and I gave consent for him to search my vehicle. So I didn't have a car, I didn't have anything to drive. So um, Najia, I texted Najia, hey, can you come pick me up? And she said, yeah, absolutely, send me your address. And so she picked me up from my house in Clayton, and I rode with her to the signature apartments. And so as I got there, um, there was this girl named Savannah Farrell which I didn't know who this person was, but apparently she was really close with Christina. Um, as I got there, she was starting to question me and interrogate me, like, why are you even here in the first place? Like, what are you doing here? And she started asking me about the receipt that they found in my bedroom, about the bleach and everything. And that, that's when, like, I started getting, like, nervous. Like, like I kind of regretted showing up in the first place. And I left because, one, um, Abraham told a dude, hey, tell him that I don't want him here, tell him to leave. So I understood that, so I left, and then um, I was willing to leave. And then Savannah Farrell told me, if I see your mock shot on the internet, I promise you I will find a way to murder you. She threatened me. How and when did you get arrested? I got arrested on Wednesday, April 7th, 
of 2021 at around 4.30 p.m. I got arrested at the Nightdale Station Park in Nightdale, North Carolina, downtown Nightdale. Um, I was actually meeting with a, I was meeting with a different attorney. Um, he was actually, he had actually gone home. So he was like, hey, I'm home. If you want to meet me at the park, and then um, we'll talk there, and then we'll go together to the detectives division. And as we arrived there, I, my mom, my sister, and myself, we all went there. My mom was driving. And so um, as I sat down, I didn't even, I got, all I said was, hi, how are you? Next thing you know, I had like the SUVs like pull up, and a bunch of people were running towards me, and they told me that they had a warrant for my arrest for murder. How long did it take you to come forward to even tell your attorneys what happened? It took me two years. Did you at some point tell your attorneys what you're telling us now? Yes. How long did it take you to do that? Two years. Why did it take you two years to do that? Because after I found out of Kaylee's arrest for, um, you know, our arrest that was not a murder charge, it was accessory after the fact to murder and obstruction of justice. I felt relief, I felt safe to be able to come forward, and that's when um, I had my family um, contact my, my attorneys, and that's when I spoke to them with a private investigator and told them the exact truth, exactly what happened, where the evidence is at, and I told them where the key to Christina's bedroom is, which is still currently under my parents' house in Clayton. Did anything happen to your family to give some credence to your fear of Kaylee? Yes. So when I was when I had first time arrested, um, there um, I know that there has been vandalism going on in my home. Um, you know, people were going over there spray painting my house, saying you raised a murder. Um, you know, making rude off comments. I took that as a message from Kaylee, saying, "Remember to not open your mouth." So more fear came into me. Then, so that's why I didn't say anything at all. And to your knowledge, did your lawyer subpoena Kaylee to be a witness in this trial? Yes, they did. And she pled the fifth. Objection. Well, sustained. And um, the jury will disregard that last statement, motion to strike allowed. So, have we talked about you buying your laptop and iPad from Best Buy? No, we haven't. Let's talk about that. Where did you buy your laptop and your iPad? So my laptop, we originally bought it at Best Buy. Um, and so when we bought it at Best Buy, um, we bought it with a like a security thing for like antivirus, Norton antivirus something. Um, so it protected it from like anybody trying to hack it and stuff like that. And then my iPad, I got it from Verizon. Um, because since I was a student at the community college and at Liberty University online, um, it was around Christmas time. I got a deal. I got a hunt, I got like a discount for being a student. So instead of me paying the full price, I got a discount and I didn't pay the full price. And so I also got like the security thing on my iPad, you know, because I used to always go out to like cafeterias and I used to go out to Starbucks and connect to the Wi-Fi. So I didn't want like any bugs coming in. Um, you know, as a computer science as a security major, you know, I learned the importance of, you know, security and the, you know, all the antiviruses that go on and all the hacking. So um, I took, you know, measures on that. And um, and at the detectives division, my phone also has that um, protective software. And at the detectives division, when I was um, first meeting with Detective O'Neill, um, he did not ask me for the codes and, uh, of my uh, laptop and of my iPad. He only asked me for the codes of my iPhone, which is 739180. And then I think it was a week ago, or a little over a week ago, I can't remember, it was a week from last Friday, I gave Detective O'Neill my, um, my codes to my laptop and my iPad. Um, I have nothing to hide, there's nothing in there. Um, you know, uh, it's just schoolwork and it's just, you know, business information and that's, and that's it. And I provided him with the codes of my iPad and I provided him with the code of my laptop. No mysterious diaries about sexual fantasies in there? No, absolutely not. No, no, nothing like that at all. May I have just one moment, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am.
couple more questions, Eric. Um, a big one. What, if anything, did you have to do with Christina's murder? Um, the only thing I had to do with it is I lied to the police and I helped clean up. Did you murder Christina? Absolutely not. She was my biggest golden ticket. I needed her alive more than anybody in this world in order to proceed with my immigration process. Who did murder Christina? Kaylee Elizabeth Lynch Furricano killed Christina the morning of April 3rd of 2021 in her bedroom. The I have nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Cross-examination? Yes, sir. All right. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Hernandez Mendez. Good afternoon. Um, is it all right if I call you Eric? That's fine. Um, so just now, ultimately, you indicate in your direct examination that you did not have anything to do with the direct murder of Christina Matos. Is that your testimony here today? Yes, ma'am. And you indicate that the only thing that you did was lie to police and try to clean up. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you admit, based on your testimony here today, that you lied to Abraham and Yolanda Matos when they called you and asked you what room Christina was living in at that time. Yes, yes ma'am. I lied to them. And you admit that you lied during a homicide investigation to these detectives that are behind me, specifically Detective O'Neill. Yes, ma'am. I only spoke with Detective O'Neill, so I only lied to him. I, I never consulted with um, Sergeant or Detective Tripp. I never spoke to him. I, I, the first time I met him here in court, uh, I did lie to Detective O'Neill. He was the only law enforcement officer that I spoke to okay. at homicide. And so, and then today, um, you've told uh, this version of, of what occurred back on April 3rd and April 4th of 2021 to Christina Matos. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, let me ask you a few questions about your testimony. Um, Eric, isn't it true that your immigration status and specifically gaining citizenship was of utmost importance to you? It was one of the most important things to me um, in order for me to be able to pursue my career and, um, and later on help my family provide for what they provided me growing up my, for both my sister and I. Okay. So based on your testimony that we've heard here today, it sounds like it was a, it, it, it was of some might say life or death importance to you. Is that right? What do you mean by that? I'm not quite understanding. Your future was in the balance. Am, am I right about that? Yes, it was, especially since we haven't even put in a single application at all. So um, I needed her alive, like I said, more than anybody in this world in order to be able to continue with my process. And you were scared of being uh, deported at some point, um, isn't that true? Yes, ma'am, I was scared of that. And you wanted to receive, rightfully so, a lot of the benefits that others who don't work as hard as you enjoy all the time, isn't that true? Correct. Financial aid? Financial aid, government help, student loans, um, you know, as an undocumented student, um, you know, you've been to law school, so. I'm sure you know the expenses that it is to, you know, purchase textbooks and everything. So, imagining, imagine you having to work 80 hours a week and paying it out of pocket. That was me. That was me paying off my school out of pocket because I wasn't able to um, gain the benefits of financial aid nor um, student loans. And I even had to go to a private university online because government, public Universities like UNC Chapel Hill, NC State, East Carolina University, um, they have the in-state, out-of-state tuition, and so obviously I'm out-of-state tuition, so it was going to be ridiculously expensive. I was not going to be able to afford that. Okay. And so ultimately you wanted to enjoy some of these kind of financial benefits, um, but also just not be scared of being asked to return to Mexico um, at any given time. when you, Your family lives here, correct? Correct, and it wasn't... And it wasn't because I wanted to benefit from financial aid because I have I only, when I got arrested, I was finishing my junior year at Liberty University. So I really only have two semesters left over. So it was like already paid off. I was already like almost done with it. But I wanted to benefit to be able to obtain a job, you know, and then later on in life be able to provide for my family. And so would you say that this was something that was in the forefront of your mind in late 2020 and early 2021. Yes, ma'am. 
And as you indicated, you're taking college courses. Yes, ma'am. Um, you made good grades. I did. I graduated um, with honors. And you were working 70 to 80 hours a week on top of all that schoolwork as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, and other folks, namely your roommates, Christina and Kaylee, you didn't perceive that they were working quite as hard as you were. Isn't that true? Mm, I wouldn't say that because I know that I will, I'm not putting an I don't put an excuse that because I have to work hard, that person has to work hard too. No, because again, if I was in Kaylee's position or in Christina's position who are U.S. citizens, I would be more than happy to be able to benefit from financial aid so I can focus more on my studies and I have to work a uh, labor job every single day because I worked from Monday to Sunday. I worked every single day. And on top of that, I still have to try to manage school in order for me to be able to pay off my courses and again, be able to finish up, um, you know, like be able to pay it off. And speaking of that labor job, it was, you're referring to your job in the yarn mill, is that right? Um, at the yarn mill, I was only, I had just started that job. I started that job like mid to end February until the point that I got arrested. Um, so, um, yeah, we can say that too, because I worked the same amount of hours. It was just a little bit more laid back, because where I was working before, it was more like kitchen. I was working more in the kitchen, you know, cooking and stuff like that. So it was a little bit more tiring, exhausting. But at the yarn plant, I was working the same amount of hours, but I was making more money at the yarn plant. And it was more laid back, and it fit in better with my schedule. Okay. Um, but it was hard manual labor still? Yes. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about your relationship with Christina that you testified about. Um, it, you indicated that you loved her as a friend, I think is your testimony here today. Yes, ma'am. Um, but didn't have any romantic feelings about no, her? absolutely not. We see from your text messages that you began, um, kind of texting, I think in August of 2020. Is that, had you, you had you two ever communicated via text before that time? the beginning of State's Exhibit 114 that we've seen here in court? No, so first, um, when I met uh, Christina through Kaylee, um, it was in July of 2020. I can't remember the, I just know it was July. Um, and um, first, I started texting through a social media platform called Snapchat. And so um, that's where we would text first. And then later on, as we started getting closer, um, she gave me her phone number so we could FaceTime and then text and stuff like that. So yes. You're about right, around August is when I started texting her through, like, message, like, regular message. And then, um, I mean, obviously, you were, you recall texting with Christina back then, right? Yes, ma'am. And you've kind of seen the text messages that have been presented here in court um, as part of kind of the discovery in this case. Isn't that, is that safe to say? That's safe to say, yes, ma'am. Um, and in the late part of 2020 and the very early part of 20, um, 2021, um, you can see kind of how your relationship is. You, you helped her move into um, her apartment. Isn't that true? Yes, ma'am. I helped her and Kaylee move into the apartment. So actually kind of lugging her boxes up the stairs, that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. She had a lot of stuff. And specifically as to Christina, you do you do favors for her. Is, is that correct? Favors like what? What do you mean by that? She texts you and asks you to go to the store to buy her things. Um, um, so at the time when I helped her move into the signature apartment, she didn't have a car yet. So um, she would call me and be like, hey, on my day off, you know, well, I didn't have a day off, but normally the days that I was normally available throughout the week when I was working at these restaurants was Tuesdays because on Tuesdays I didn't go into work till 4 p.m. So I was free, like, during the day like morning and late, like early afternoon. So that's when like she would text me and call me and be like, hi, can you come help me, um, you know, go buy groceries? Like, can you take me somewhere? I was like, sure, why not? And so I went to go pick her up. We would get like coffee at Starbucks and we were like, I would go shopping with her. And you know, I even went out to the Cary Auto Mall and we went to different dealerships to try to look for a car for her that she wanted to buy. And so she'd text you things that you she wanted you to buy her, and you would, isn't that right? Buy her. Like beauty supplies, groceries, no, things like that. I never bought her beauty supplies, nor I bought groceries. When I was living with her, I bought groceries for the both of us, you know, because I didn't care if she ate out of my groceries, but like, pay for her makeup and stuff like that, I never did. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may, um, 
We publish State's Exhibit 114, which is the text. Any objection? Questions about it? No objection. All right. Yes, ma'am, Madam Deputy, ma'am. Public State's Exhibit 114 to the jury. And, Your Honor, may I um, approach to uh, grab the State's laser pointer? Yes, ma'am. Specifically, um, up here on the screen, uh, looking at State's Exhibit 114, um, which is 142 of 677 on State's Exhibit 114. Um, Mr. Hernandez Mendez, Eric, do you see this uh, first message that's from you to Mommy Tina back on October 24th of 2020? Do you mind zooming in? I can't see that one, sorry. Like, I see a little bit blurry. There you go. Okay. You Green, a little bit better. Green message right here. Yes, ma'am. And that's your text to Christina, and it says, what's that wine called that you like? Correct. Okay. And then ultimately, here this next message is from Christina to you, and she says something that looks like maybe she was trying to say rosé. Yes, that's how it's spelled, rosé. Okay. And um, the next message is from you to Christina, and you say a lot of O's and then the word T-U-N. I meant to say fun. Okay. No, like yum. I just misspelled it. Okay. So we see in the next box, you correct yeah, it. Yeah, yum. There you go. And said yum. Yes, ma'am. Um, and you then you indicate to her it sounds good, too. Is that right? Is the yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. This next message from you to uh, Christina says alcoholics these days. Yes, ma'am. What are y'all talking about here? So, Christina and I, um, you know, we always used to hang out a lot. So, before we came up with a plan, you know, like, be before this whole immigration stuff, um, you know, Christina and I got along really well. So, like, every so often, um, you know, she, um, I spend the night with Christina, you know, we drink, we hang out. And so, um, we, I had a friend who was willing to buy the wine for us because I was 20, I was 19 years old when she hadn't moved into the apartment, so I was not able to buy any alcoholic drink. And so, um, she, uh, I know she likes to drink wine, I like wine, and so I asked her what kind of wine should I get, you know, because I, I, I don't know what kind she like, I, I, I'll drink any wine. And then she said rosé, and so that's when I texted a friend and said, hey, can you get me some rosé wine, please? And okay. then that's when you buy it. So we bought it to like hang out. We were trying to hang out that day. Okay, so you were buying it for you and she to drink together? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I will go forward just a little bit and say it's to the 114, Judge. Get to the right spot here. Um, on here, uh, on State's Exhibit 114, um, on page 173, we see this text message on December 1st of 2020 um, from you to Christina, and it says, hey, love. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And that's how you all refer to each other. That's how I refer to a lot of my friends, you know, like my friend Dana, my friend Adele. When I call them on the phone, I'm like, hi, love. I mean, I, that, that's just a thing I always say to, to, to you know, to my, to my friends who are girls. You know, I say, hey, love, how are you? Okay, love, thank you. You know, it's just a regular, like, greeting that I have. And you called Christina baby as well in these text messages, as as you could see kind of looking through these texts before testifying? Like it's, it, like I said, it's just, it's not an intimate thing. It was just like a, okay, babe, you know, like, it's just a regular, like, like talk that we have as friends. You know, I call some of my other girlfriends babe, too. Like, oh, thanks, babe, you know, like, but like not as an intimate way. Okay. Um, going down, skipping down to December 7th, um, Christina uh, says to you, you up at 12 on December 7th of 2020, around 3.12 in the morning. Um, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And then um, the very next day, it looks like there's a whole day of a break 
and then out of nowhere, uh, Christina texts you ground beef cheese pizza on December 8th of 2020. Um, can, you, can you scroll up to that previous? I, worked, I, oh, I got a little distracted. Uh, okay, uh huh. So the December 7th text happens, and it looks like there's no response here. Yeah, I, I, I just can't see far away, that's why. Okay. But safe to say that during this particular time, December of 2020, before mm -hmm. you moved in with Christina, you all were hanging out a lot too in person, right? Yes, ma'am. And yes, we, were. we heard some testimony earlier in this trial about how you'd sleep over at Christina's house very often um, at the end of 2020. Is that right? Yes. And you'd sleep with her in her bed? Yes. Okay. And so we see some text messages here, but that wasn't the extent of your interaction with Christina. Isn't that true? Because... You'd have text messages, but then you'd be interacting in person, obviously, as well. Right, yes. Okay. Yep. But on December 8th, at 1226 in the morning, she texts you ground beef cheese pizza. Do you see that text here? Yes, ma'am. And then uh, the next text, text message from her immediately following that is, that's it? Right. And so did she want that, did she want you to get that delivered to her? I don't remember. I think I remember one time um, she had like problems with her debit card or something like that, and I was already at home. I was doing a little bit of homework. That's why I was able to respond to her message. And she said, "Hey, I'm trying to order a pizza, but I don't. I, I'm having problems with my card. Can you please help me out? I'll send you money through. I think it was Apple Pay or Cash App." And so I was like, "Sure, I'll do you the favor. No problem." I mean, I didn't mind ordering the pizza like okay. if she needed it, like you know. So here, this next text message we see in State's Exhibit 114 on December 8th at 2020 at 12.26 in the morning says Domino's on Western Boulevard. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. And then ultimately you respond to that message right away and um, you say, send me your full address. Right. Okay. And then she, this uh, text message from Christina to you says, never mind, I got it. Can you scroll up? Not just to the previous message. 12, 8, okay, scroll down. So a minute later, oh, I don't know, I don't remember. Okay. I think she was just, I don't know, I don't even remember, that was a long time ago. But I remember one time she asked me if I could please order a pizza because she was having problems with like her debit card, or she lost it or something like that, and so she sent me money through, I think it was Cash App, or Apple Pay, I can't remember. And she sent me the money, and so I ordered it for her through my card, and so she could have it delivered to her. But there's several interactions like this between she and you. Do you remember ordering her food to be delivered to her house? Yes, that one time, yes. Okay. Several times you ordered her pizza. Is that right? Did I? I, I, I might have. Okay. And you buy her groceries? No, I didn't buy her groceries. I bought us groceries. Okay. There's a difference. And... You'd buy her things from the um, from the drugstore if she needed it. Drugstore. I, I don't remember. I'm sure, I'm sure I did. Maybe. I don't know. I did her a favor. She does favors for me. I do favors for her. Even with Kaylee, I was like that. Sometimes Kaylee would buy me lunch. I buy her lunch. Christina would buy me lunch. I buy lunch for her. It was just you know. I mean, it's it's, it's just a friendship thing. Judge, I'll go now to um, states is at one fourteen. I'll go to page five. 47. Um, do you see this text message at the top of the screen right here, February 11th of 2021 from Christina to you? Yeah. And she says to you, whenever you get out of your interview, can you go to the beauty store and get me a bonnet? Right. Okay. Do you remember this happening? Yeah, now that I'm looking at the message, yes. Okay. And your response to her um, back on February 11th of 2021 is, honey, I'm not going to have time. Right. Okay. And then you say to her, I'm still waiting to go into my interview, have to be at work by 3 on this, uh, February 11th of 2021. Is that right? Right. Okay. Did you ultimately go and buy her that when she no. asked you that? Mm -hmm. No, because I was, um, I was in, the, in the middle of an interview. And then I had to be make it. I had to make. I think I was the interview at the yarn plant around this time until I then later got accepted and I started training around mid to late February. Okay. Um, do you recall a time that she uh, left some of her items at home and she was at work and she asked you to 
bring her items to her at work. Right. Do yes. you remember that? Yes. Tell us about what happened there. Um, there were times where I do remember I did take or something, and there were times where I just couldn't because I mean I'm guessing it was late or something, but. We all forget stuff at work all the time, and and if, and if she forgot something at work, I mean at home that she needed at work, like a charger or something, I'll do her the favor and I'll take the charger. I mean I don't see anything wrong with that. Okay, so she would ask, she asked you to bring her some things to work, like her face wipes and and things like that that she needed. Do you remember that? Mm, I remember she needed something like that one time. Yes. And when she wants something, is it safe to say she's pretty? Um, adamant about it. Yes, she is. If I tell her I can't come, she's like, but why can't you? You're at home. What are you doing? You, you have time. I'm not that far away. She'll be very adamant, like you said. Like, she'll be, like, very persistent, like, pushy. But, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't see how that's relevant. Do you recall a time where she asked you over and over again to bring her some items to her workplace, but you were not, you were telling her no, you, you couldn't do that? Right, yeah, absolutely. And um, do you recall what the reason was? Um, I don't remember. I'm, it depends on the time that she sent me that message. If you tell me the time that you saw that message, I can, I can answer that question a lot better. Um, we'll come back to that. Okay. Um, so ultimately, in, in late 2020, um, you're hanging out with Christina a lot, you're sleeping over at her house a decent amount. Is that safe to say? Right. And um, and I also get along with Kaylee too, so, so obviously I'm always there, yes. Okay. And sh you said sometime in 2020 was when she agreed um, to marry you, um, and that, that this was somewhat transactional, kind of a convenience. Um, is that what your testimony was? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the marriage was agreed on my birthday, my 20th birthday, which would be on uh, December the 11th of 2000, I mean, 2020, okay. when, when um, we had the agreement. And so you started, um, you started texting her pictures of rings that you might, might want to buy her. Right, yeah. And so it was more than just a... Um, we're going to go to the courthouse and, and we're going to sign the paperwork. You actually were going to buy rings, wear them, that kind of thing. Yes, because um, in order for us to be able to go forward with this, we had to try to show that we were actually like in love, but really we weren't. We were just trying you know, to make it look like we were for whenever we went to the interview with the immigration attorneys. Um, you know, we could present like, oh, we're actually in love. But again, it was just a sham marriage. We just pretended to do that so we could show evidence that we were falling in love. But really, we weren't. It was just like a like a deal thing that we had going on. And she offered that you could move in with her, and that worked out great for you, right? Right. Yeah, because we had to prove that um, we were living together. So um, at the time that uh, we had our meeting with the immigration attorney. Um, we, we decided to go ahead and move in together because we had to prove that we were living together through a lease and stuff like that. Okay. But also that was um, worked out well financially speaking because, um, because you could pay half the rent or half plus a little bit, it sounds like, for Christina's room if you two were sharing it. Correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, was there also an issue about you um, staying at your house with your family? What do you mean by that? We heard some evidence earlier in the trial that Christina had said to some of her friends that you were kicked out of your house. No, that was all a lie. So um, I told Christina, well, we agreed that if they asked why I moved in, we weren't going to say because, you know, I'm going to marry him for like, it's, it's, it's a fraudulent marriage. We're not going to say that. So I just told her, if anybody asked, just say that I got in a fight at home or something. But no, I never had, I never got kicked out of home. I never, I, I grew up in the best home ever and I was always welcome at home. Um, you know, we're a very close family. So all that is a lie. That was just like a, like a script, like an act. Okay. A script or an act. Um, and you could live in downtown Raleigh for only $400 a month. Um, 
I think we saw in the lease documents it was a little right, over. Right, it was like a little over, like, 463, if I can remember exactly, something like that. It's kind of unheard of in this day and age. Huh? Kind of unheard of in this day and age, that right. price. Yeah, it's very rare. Um, and you could sleep in the same bed with Christina every night, who at that right. point is your best friend, right? Right, yeah, she's my best friend. And you said in your interview with Detective O'Neill that Christina and Kaylee were your only friends at that time. Was that true? No, I had um, other friends too, but they were the ones who I was the closest with at that time. Who were your other friends? Um, you know, I have a lot of them. Dana, one that's named Dana. Um, she, she's been showing up to trial too. My best friend, Laura, who's right there. Um, I consider all of them my best friends. Um, uh, you know, my friend, Miss, uh, Miss, uh, Ronnie, uh, who I consider, really I consider her my second. I'm sure my parents already kind of figured, but they were just, you know, just letting me take my time with that. Um, um, so I have other friends too, like Miss Jojo, Miss Jocelyn Everett, who was testifying here. I have friends of all sorts. I hang around people that I can learn from. I hang around people where I can learn something new. And so that's the kind of people that I try to be around, which is why I was friends with Kaylee. Even though she always had an attitude and she could be sometimes, you know, she could scream at me. Uh, I was still friends with her because she's a smart girl. She graduated higher in the class than I did. So, um, you know, when her and I would hang out, it's like a switch right there. So, like, she knows the kind of people I like to be around. And she knows the kind of place I like to go. Like, I like to go eat at, like, hang out at a cafe, let's say, and sit down and do homework. But then when she's not with me, it's like the switch goes opposite way and she goes with the bad influence the same people that Christina would hang around with and, and I know it's the same people because they know a lot of the mutual friends that they both had so um but I never knew them personally because I would never be around them so so obviously you know that the detectives took your phone right and yes, they extracted the data from it yes um so they they know a lot about your whereabouts and who you were talking to back in early the early part of 2021. Right. Is it safe to say that you were mostly hanging out with either Kaylee or Christina on yes. those days? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of Kaylee, now that you've brought this up, um, you indicated that when she was with you, you said she'd kind of um, act one way, but then she'd kind of not be as great at, in your words. Um, when she was hanging out with other people. Yes, Is that right? Yes. Okay, so you were kind of the person who was a good influence on her. Yes, and, and you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of person who, who, who just wants to be an influence. I'm just the kind of person who just likes to, you know, just be around a, 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 a peaceful environment because growing up as, as an undocumented person, uh, my family always taught me the importance of always, you know, being on your best behavior, you know, go to school, work hard, because um, in Mexico, a lot of people, I'm from Mexico originally, so in my country, there are some places that people don't even have education past the eighth grade. So um, I always try to take um, all the things that I had available to me, and I try to use it wisely as I could. So I was always, um, you know, the one who was a peacemaker. I tried to teach other people when, when they were doing something wrong, uh, I'm not perfect, um, you know, I'm human too, um, but I, I would try to like, you know, give them advice, you know, because like I said, I'm not perfect either, so. So you, is it safe to say you wanted Kaylee to be a better person? Mm, kind of, like I try to, you know, like, like talk to her and, and tell her like, hey, stop being wrong with people, but her theory was, well, I'm out of home, I'm, I go to NC State, and I'm going to party, and that's going to be my life. I'm going to party, and I get to do whatever I want, because I don't live at home anymore. And that was her theory, and as a human being, we cannot change what another people thinks. 
if you have a friend yourself who acted the same way, I'm sure you couldn't forcefully change that person. So I don't have control over that person. I can just try to give them the best of the advice that I could try to give them. And you felt that way about Christina too, didn't you? Yes, I tried to give her the best advice that I could. And then she took it. Very good. I was really happy for her. And then she did it. Well, like I said again, I try, you know, I can't change a person. Um, I can't change them for, for, for what they've been doing. Um, if they want to go their own way of life, that's fine. But in this case, I tried to kind of like help Christina out a little more because I wanted her to do better for herself. Uh, she had mentioned to me that she was tired of dancing. Um, and so with this whole immigration process and everything, I tried to make sure she didn't get in trouble and, and, and you know, there wasn't anything funny going on like and I think you said to Detective O'Neill in your interview that we watched on the, on the screen there that, as to Christina, my goal was to fix her. Right. Um, and, I, and I was fixing her. Right. I was fixing her as in, like, I was, like, giving her advice. Like, that's what I meant by fixing. Like, I was trying to give her advice, um, you know, to enroll in school because in the spring semester of 2021, she wasn't taking any more weight tech courses. So I tried to, you know, influence her, like, hey go back to school. She wanted to be a flight attendant at the time, and she was looking at schools like Dallas, Texas, a good flight attendant school, so I told her, okay, well, try to take some courses, try to get certified, and I will try to help you out to do that. That's what I mean by fixing. Okay. So in your opinion, back in the early part of 2021, the way that you were conducting your life was better than how Kaylee and Christina were going about conducting their lives. The people who were they were hanging out with, how they were spending their time, the work that they did, um, it, was that how you felt? Can you repeat the question again, like more clear? I, I don't know how to answer that question. You were you were working hard in the early part of 2021, right? Correct. 70 to 80 hours a week. Right. Taking college classes. Yes, ma'am. Above your grade level. Right. Is that right? Yes. They were spending their time, in your words, with people who were bad influences. Correct. And partying all the time. Right. And you didn't approve of Christina's job. No. And you didn't approve of how Kaylee was acting in, no. in certain instances. No, I wasn't. Um, but as to, again, going back to Christina, um, you moved in with her. Um, it was actually earlier that, that you moved in with her than when you actually signed the paperwork. Am I right about that? Yes, ma'am. So she had lost her job at the men's club. And, uh, you know, she was doing, like, side work, but, like, obviously she wasn't making enough money. I know she was working at the sweepstakes. She was working at different sweepstakes. And so she wasn't making the same amount of money that she would make as a dancer or, like, in a club like that. So um, in December, she did not have enough to pay her full rent, and she was going to be evicted. So she asked me, hey, can you move in earlier with me and, and help me with, like, half the rent? I was like, sure, why not? I'm going to move in with you anyway, so I'll try to help you out, you know, because um, I don't know who her co-signer was, but I didn't want them, I didn't want her not paying effect their credit to, that's my biggest thing right there, always be on time on everything, so I, I you know, I wanted to help her out in that aspect. Okay. And so, um, <laughs> you moved in with her, and you were sleeping in the same bed. Yes, ma'am. And, um... In the early part of 2021, that's when we can see in the text messages that she t start texting you and saying, you know, don't come home tonight, right? Right. I mean, that happened r pretty regularly. Yes. So that would happen because she would have her clients over. Like, she would have, like, a guy over that she would be, like, sleeping with or having sex with. And that was, like, kind of, like, a little bit of a concern for both me and Kaylee, who were living in that apartment, who were living at the apartment at the time. Because we don't know who these people are. These are random people that Christina would meet. Some of them she would meet with again, but a lot of them there were um, uh, new people that she would meet. So I don't know how these people are. I don't know how 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 they acted. And the fact that I have signed, like uh, eventually I signed a lease to bedroom B. So that bedroom was going to be under my name too. So let's say if, if one of the guys was to bring drugs or anything, and the police bus and they go in and they find out that that bedroom is also under my name, I didn't want to try to get involved with like any sort of like law, like like uh, in such a in like a in a criminal matter. I didn't want to be involved in anything like that. So that's why it's concerning to me. That's the way I thought. It. Okay, um, but isn't it true that you were also frustrated that you couldn't go into your room that you had as much claim to as she did at that point? 
Absolutely. Okay. And she she texts you, you know, just go to your parents' house. Right. And that was all the way in Clayton. Right. Okay. But sometimes you didn't have clothes. Right, because I had all my clothes in Raleigh, so what I would do was I would show up to, um, to the apartment, um, grab some clothes, and then I would make my way to my parents' house, or sometimes I would sleep with Kaylee. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Madam Dean, it's going to take our, our break. Um, ladies and gentlemen, once again, please do not express an opinion, do not form an opinion, do not discuss the case. I just want you to take your break. We're going to come back at 4 o'clock. Everyone else remain seated while the jury leaves the courtroom to leave your pins and pads in the chairs. We'll see you at 4 o'clock.
Ms. Newton. Thank you, Judge. Yes, ma'am. Um, Eric, um, I have a few more questions about kind of your relationship with Christina leading up to April of 2021. Um, you also uh, would loan her money if she would ask. Is that right? Yes. Things like gas. Um, you would spot her money for rent, things like that. Um, only for like little tiny things like gas, never rent. Uh, gas, it would be, you know, stuff like that. But um, eventually I was paying her um, for the deal that we um, have made in order to arrange the immigration process. Okay. And so, um, and you, you bought her a phone though. You bought her that phone. I. It, Technically, yes, but that I should pay that off with the down payment that I gave before we got married. With I, I gave her like a little over four thousand um, out of the fifteen thousand needed. So I had already paid off five thousand dollars to the immigration attorneys. I had um, pay off Christina like to be exact, maybe like forty four hundred dollars. I had already paid her, and so with that money that I paid her um, as like down payment in order for us to get married and to continue. Um, she bought an iPhone with that 4400 that I gave her, and then I was going to give her a thousand a month from there until the 15000 are paid off. Okay, that was your agreement, a thousand dollars a month there? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And some of them, I get some of the payments, some of the money I gave it to her through, I can't remember if it was Apple Pay or Cash App, and part of it was in cash. Okay. Um, but we saw those text messages earlier in the trial. February 24th, she's saying, I want the full amount that you owe me. Isn't that true? By that, she meant, um, like, the, so at first it was going to be 5000 It was like, that was going to be 5000 but um, I was 600 short. So um, so I was like, well, I can give you, like, uh, I told her previously, I can give you 4400 now. But then, um, she, I, and, and I had the cash in my car um, when I was at work at the yard plant. So I had part of the cash already in my car. And, and I had part of it still in my bank account. So then I told her, okay, I can just give you like a thousand right here through Apple Pay and then I'll give you the rest whenever I see you on Friday. I, ha I have the cash on my card. Did you say car or card? Car, car. Mm -hmm. And that was around February of 2021? Uh, I don't recall exactly the exact date of the payment, but it, it was around that time. So what, and you talked about this on direct, but your original plan to get married, you said there was no agreement for money. Correct. When we had agreed, um, when she had agreed to, uh, you know, marry me for the status, um, she was, there was never an agreement for the money, but, you know, since she was doing something very kind for me, I willingly, you know, wanted to pay her for it. Okay. So then what was the agreement? The agreement was 15000 I told her I'll give her 15000 and I'll give it to her for payments. And she said that I was completely fine. Okay. Um, Your Honor, if I may just have one moment. Yes, Your Honor, may I, um, I republish State Exhibit 114, which are the text messages up on the screen? Oh, wow. <coughs> um, up here on the screen, we see um, State Exhibit 114, uh, specifically at page 597 of 677. Um, on February 24th of 2021, isn't it true that Christina texted you, Eric, you got to give me what you told me you would? Yes, she did. Okay. And then the very next text message immediately following that is, you got to stop by and do that from her. Is that right? That is right. And then the next text message from her immediately following that is because you pushed it back two days. Correct. Okay. And then your next message to her um, is on the next page, also on February 24th of 2021. 
and you say, I will, but I'm all the way back in Sanford today and tomorrow from 8 to 8. Is that right? Yes. So how, what was the agreement of how much you were supposed to pay her at that time? At that time, the agreement was that I was going to give it um, $4,400. We had already talked about, um, you know, not having the full five uh, that thousand that I was going to originally give her. So I was like, I'll give you $4,400 now, and then I'll give you the payments like we agreed on. She was like, oh, yeah, that's completely fine. And so I told her on, the, on an exact day when I would give it to her. But, again, I was working at the yarn plant, and I had fallen asleep. And the bank that I'm with, um, they closed really early. So at the time I woke up, uh, the bank was already closed, and I ha and I wasn't able to get the money out because of the ATM. You're only allowed to get like a certain amount. I think my my limit was like three hundred. I think uh, that I can only do. I think it was like a day. So um, I wasn't gonna go back every day to the ATM and take out three hundred, three hundred. So I just wanted to go in person when it was open, just do one transaction out. But um, I, I told her exactly on what day I was going to give it to her, and when I told her that I had fallen asleep, like, in person, she would, she would like, be very pushy, but you said this, this, and this, but I was like, yes, I know, but I fell asleep. I still got you, though. I still have the money for you, which I didn't know paying to her. Okay. So, here, the next text message is from her to you saying, send me your location. Correct. Right? And that, this is kind of how she, how she would be, is that, isn't that true? Yes, that's how she would be, yes. Okay. Um, the next text message from her to you says, because I need it. Right. And then you say to her, um, in your next text message, for what? Is that right? Correct. And then she says to you, immediately following that on February 24th, I don't have any money. Right. And then her next text message to you immediately following that is, I just started this new job. That is correct. And then you say to her, how much do you need? Is that Correct. true? And then she says to you, I want the full thing, Eric. Why? W-Y-M. Yes, correct. What does W-Y-M mean? What do you mean? Okay. And then you say to her in response to that, um, on 224 at 259.53 p.m., I'm able to make transfers now because the month started over. That is correct. And she says to you immediately following that at 3 p.m. on the same day, so transfer all on Apple Pay. Correct. And then she says to you, or I can come to you. Isn't that is that correct. True? And ultimately, we saw earlier in the trial, but you kind of go back and forth some, but you ultimately do transfer, I think, $1,000 oh, yeah. on Absolutely. Apple Pay. Yes, okay. I did. Your Honor, may I, um, may I uh, publish 68. State's Exhibit 68, which is Stacy Snyder's photos of his, the, his vehicle? Any objection? No, Your Honor. Allow. Um, I'm showing you now what's in State's Exhibit 68, which is the photos that CCBI agent Stacy Snyder took of the um, of inside your car. Do you remember those photos? Yes. And she took the, this photo of two receipts that were found in your vehicle. Um, do you remember hearing that testimony and seeing this photo? Yes, I do. And it looks like, based on these receipts, that on 226, so two days after the text messages that we just read, you deposited $10 into your savings right. so that you could withdraw $2,750. Yes, correct. So um, I tried to withdraw the. I had exactly on the account twenty seven fifty, um, but the lady told me you you can't leave your account zero because they have like a policy thing, and they were like you need to have at least ten dollars in your account. So I was like, okay, well then I had some cash on me. So I was like, this is ten dollars, and then I was able to withdraw the two thousand seven hundred fifty dollars, and that's the part that I gave her in cash. I gave her other money through. Um, electronically, like Apple Pay or Cash App, I can't quite remember which one I use. Okay, so the remainder that you have in your savings account with the credit union, you withdrew on February 26th so that you could pay to Christina Matos, is that Correct. true? Mm -hmm. Okay. You did not have any other money remaining in that account, minus the $10 that you put in at that time? Correct, I have money remaining in my uh, checkings account. Okay. And you also spent $5,000 on an immigration attorney. As Correct. Well. Through a loan. I got a loan through that. 
And you mentioned $800 that you spent or needed for an application that you needed to make with respect to your immigration status. It was about $500 because um, the attorney told me uh, in order to make this easier, um, uh, let's, um, I, need, I need to have like a form um, to verify my exits and my entries into the United States. So she had to send some kind of like, like form or application in order for her to get that copy of my entries and my exits. And I paid her like $500 on top of the 5,000 that I had already paid them. I had to pay another 500 for the, um, for the, uh, for the paper that showed my entries and my exits. So that's why I was short of the 5,000. That's why I was only able to give like 4,400. Something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so when, and then going forward from there, you were supposed to pay her $1,000 a month. Correct. Did you pay her the $1,000 in March? Yes, I did. And what about April? I hadn't yet because I hadn't gone to the bank yet. What day were you supposed to pay her? Uh, the first of the month? No, it could have been like any time during the month. <coughs> okay. We didn't have like an exact date. What day in March did you pay your $1,000 to her? I can't recall. It was sometime in March, like beginning to middle of March. Okay. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really a problem because uh, she trusted me and she knew me, so it wasn't like she wasn't really worried about me not trying to pay her. She knows I'm paying her. Absolutely. Did you hear Jordan Phillips say that when Christina, someone owed Christina money, she was um, very adamant about reminding that person that they needed to give her that money? Yes, okay. she was. Mm -hmm. Safe to say that that was an accurate description. That of is an accurate um, description of Christina. Okay. Um, so at this point in in February of 2021, you are um, invested financially in this immigration um, process. Is that is that safe to say? Yes, absolutely. I had already spent like ten grand in total already, and um, I had like another ten remaining. Which wouldn't have been a problem because I was making, I was going to make monthly payments to her. So I wasn't sweating it. I was making really good money at the, at the job. And after my payments, after my college payment, after my rent, my car payment, my cell phone, utilities, food, gas, and the payment to Christina, I still had more money left over for miscellaneous. So if I wanted to go out and eat somewhere, stuff like that, I still had money. So money was never an issue for me at all. Um, but isn't it true that Christina at any point could decide to stop cooperating? I mean, ultimately you needed her to continue to um, act like she was married to you right. in a bona fide way. Right. Um, so at any point, if she changed her mind about that, um, that would have been an issue for you. Uh, that's if we would have put in the application, and that's for any person who gets married through a petition. So if you get married through somebody and you petition for them and you withdraw your application, there there could be legal consequences like a deportation order and stuff like that. But that was never the issue in this case. So had you or had you not filed your petition paperwork? Not yet. You hadn't filed any paperwork? No. We haven't filed a single petition. We're still in the middle of answering a questionnaire for the immigration attorneys. We haven't even put nothing in yet. Had you ever told anyone that you put in your petition paperwork? No. Not that I recall. Because I kept it a secret. Did you file any paperwork related to your immigration status on April 4th of 2021? No. Um, I think I was putting in like I remember I put in an application that day for like to move into another to like a different apartment after our lease ended in July. Um, so that's what I remember. That's the only application I ever put in. But immigration wise, we we we, were, we weren't even there yet because we still had to finish the questionnaire and we still had to get pictures and we still had to get a bunch of stuff ready. So nothing had gone into the petition yet. Do you recall a text message that you sent to Kaylee Lynch on April 4th saying you f filled out your application or petition? It was an application for an apartment building that, um, that, that I wanted to move into. So um, Christina, she was planning on going to New York 
uh, to do like to be like a bottle girl or something like that. And then I told her, well, I want to stay right here in North Carolina while you go up there, you know. And and so I that, that that's when I had applied to move into a different student housing complex um, because Christina um, told me that her plan was to go up to New York um, to be a bottle girl or to work up there because she met some people. And she was gonna make way more money, and you know, like a photo shoot, stuff like that. I, I don't really quite know. Yeah, if I could just have one moment. I'm sorry. If I could just have one moment. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. At some point uh, after February of 2021, in March of 2021, um, by that time, Christina was mostly sleeping over at Jordan's apartment. Is that safe to say? I, I have no idea. I don't know. I never asked her who she hang out with. I never knew these people. But, uh, the first time I ever heard of Jordan was the day that I showed up to the, um, to the uh, parking lot when I met with Abraham, Miss Yolanda, Christina's mom, and that's when I found out who Jordan was. And so she told me that she was one of Christina's friends and that she worked at the strip club with her. So that was the first time I ever heard of it. Um, every single time she went out with somebody, I never asked her. I mean, it's none of my business. I mean, so I didn't bother to ask. So you and Christina signed your leases for your separate rooms on March 29th, is that right? Yes, and the reason we did that was because um, Around mid to end of February, um, one of our former roommates, Reagan Orr, she had moved out of the bedroom D because there was a lot of problems in the apartment with stealing food and a bunch of petty stuff that was going on. And so she moved out. And so then um, there were um, two bedrooms open, which was, and then behind her, Jada moved out too, the, the one that lived in bedroom C. So, so. They moved out almost at the same time, so we had two open bedrooms. So that apartment, it was just me, um, uh, me, Christina, and Kaylee alone. And so uh, Christina, uh, she liked bedroom D because it was one of the biggest bedrooms in the apartment. I was going to move into that bedroom, but I told her, um, you don't want to move in there instead because it was a lot bigger. You know, bedroom B, she had so much stuff. You know, it was just so crowded and so, you know, uh, a small space to go around, so she moved into bedroom D, and I stayed in bedroom B. And so we were just not into the leasing office, and so we were just gonna pay off like half a rent and half like like into our original contract that we had in bedroom B. And so one day, one of the managers came in to take pictures of the two empty bedrooms um, to uh, for any damages, because when you move out, they want to make sure there weren't any damages done in the bedrooms. So when the manager first went to bedroom C, took pictures, make sure there weren't damages, and then she closed it and she locked it. And then she went to bedroom D, thinking it was empty. Again, we hadn't told the office that Christina had moved into that bedroom. So when, when the manager walked into bedroom D, she noticed that there was stuff in that bedroom, and she thought it was still Reagan stuff, but it wasn't, it was Christina's. So what she did was, she closed the door to bedroom D, and she locked it. And we had no other way to be able to get into bedroom D unless Christina signed a lease with them. So the manager locked the door, all Christina's stuff were there, 
And um, Kaylee and I, we were in the living room that day. We were just talking, you know, just hanging out, doing homework when, when, when all this occurred. And so I called Christina and I said, hey, Christina, I think we got caught. The, the manager, you know, she came in here. She locked the bedrooms and all your stuff were in there. Uh, I think we're going to have to sign our own lease. And so, um, you know, that's when, you know, we agreed to, you know, to sign our own lease. And so that's why the lease agreements that went independent with Christina on Bedroom D and me on Bedroom B, that's why it took effect on March of 29th, because that was the exact day that the manager went in there to take pictures of the bedrooms to see if nothing was damaged or anything like that. Okay. Thank you for all that information. I was just asking, was March 29th the day that you signed those? Yes, uh, I was just trying to clarify for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but she had been living in Bedroom D prior to, that was my next question, March 29th. Correct. Since the early part of March? Since late February, okay. early part of March, yes. Because as soon as Reagan moved out, she immediately went in that, in, in that bedroom. Okay. And, and you all, safe to say, kind of stopped hanging out as much at, at that time? Um, it, it was mostly because of the work schedule. So I worked at night. I went into work at 8 p.m. and I didn't get out of work till 8 a.m., sometimes 9 a.m. So I, work, I would work a 12, 13 hour shift and I lived in downtown Raleigh and I would commute all the way to Sanford. At night, it was like 40, 45 minute commute and that's with no traffic. And in the mornings, there was a lot of traffic. So it would take about an hour, an hour, 10 minutes, you know, as I get to that traffic and if I wanna go get breakfast somewhere, um, then I would um, get to the apartment. And by the time I get to the apartment, sometimes Christina's not there and if she is there, she's still sleeping. And when I do arrive at the apartment, I would. If, if I buy something to eat, I eat quick, take a quick shower, and then just go to sleep and sleep for a little. And then I wouldn't wake up again until like 3 or 4 p.m. And that's when I would do um, a little bit of homework. Sometimes I would wake up earlier than that. Sometimes I sleep later. It would just vary on how tired I was. Okay. But as of March of 2021, you were not hanging out with her on a day-to-day -day basis at that point? Correct, because of a work schedule. Um, and you indicated on your direct that you searched what happens if my U.S. citizen wife dies um, mm -hmm. out of concern that Christina might commit suicide. Correct. And so that was March 20th, okay. 2021. You were concerned mm -hmm. about that. Yes. And so where are the text messages that you talk about this with her? So I was, um, so it was one of my days off. So the good thing about the yarn plant was that um, I had one day off and I was still making more money than what I was making at the restaurant working Monday through Sunday. So I was able to get one day off and you know just relax, be able to do some homework. And it was a, and it was the first time I was able to get a day off in like a year probably. So it was nice when I started working at the yarn plant. And so one day when I was off, um, I text. Uh, I think I called her or FaceTime her like, hey, what are you doing? And she said she was in her bedroom just watching a, a TV series. And so I went over there and we were just sitting talking. We ate like chicken fingers that we were buying at the frozen aisle and at the, at the grocery store and we were just talking and then that's when she made all these suicidal comments and um, it wasn't new to me because I knew in the past that she has made comments about like her being depressed and, and her making all these sorts of suicidal comments so that really just concerned me um, like okay if I, in my mind I thought if I marry this person and she was to commit suicide uh, what happened to me would I get deported would the application not go through anymore it was just based of just trying to gain more information that's it um, based on that Google search okay so you were having this talk with her face to face correct but you heard earlier testimony in this trial did you not that um, she she was making plans for the future. She had plastic surgery planned. Isn't that true? Yes. She had travel plans with her friend Jordan. Isn't that true? From what I've heard, yes. There was no one that was very concerned at the time that she died that she had taken her own life. Because she was never open about it with a lot of people. With a lot of people, Christina was always the kind of person who was who kept everything to herself. And one of the only people that she would ever talk to about that is me, Kaylee, and Miss Yolanda. Because Miss Yolanda was aware, and even in her, when she had the interview with the detective, she even well, mentioned I that. Well, I would object to what she, well, she someone else says. Um, so that's why ultimately you perform that Google search? Correct. Okay. And you indicated in your direct examination that... Um, Ultimately, what you found out was 
the only way you could still file a petition was if you were some kind of military status. Is that what your testimony was? If the petitioner who was petitioning for their spouse to get like some sort of green card or anything, if the petitioner, the one who's petitioning for the spouse is in the military and they were to like die or something in the military, then the spouse the of, of, of the one that they were going to petition will be able to do a self-petition based off that. But since Christina was not in the military, um, you know, if she was to die, then that's it. I'm not able to do anything at all anymore. And that's based off what I understood. That was, uh, I've, I've read various websites on that. And so is it your testimony that specifically that article that you searched for and that we were able to read here in court said that? Uh, I, was, I, I read different articles. I didn't only search it from my phone. So there were times that I would use my mom's phone when I went over to um, my parents' house and I would make searches there because I didn't want anything. So like if I were to go to like immigration for an interview and they wanted to search my phone, I didn't want anything to like affect us or I didn't want that to, I, want, I didn't want them to take it the wrong way. But um, I did further research at home through my mom's phone so that it wouldn't be tracked back to me. Okay, so based on what we saw in court, Mm -hmm. um, that particular article didn't tell you that, but you're saying you did some outside research. Yes. So that no one could see that you were doing that research. Through my phone, correct. And that showed you this other answer. Right, correct. Okay. All right. That's what I, what, from what I understood. I don't know immigration law. I was just trying to gain um, my own knowledge behind it, you know, more facts about it. Okay. Um... And then uh, let's talk about the specifically the events of kind of April 2nd um, to April 4th that you testified about here in court. Um, this uh, account uh, that you told us of witnessing this, this gruesome murder, um, I'll go ahead and ask you first. When you were in the safety of the detective division on April 4th and April 5th of 2021, why did you not tell the truth at that time? I was not in my right mind. Uh, I was still scared. Uh, the murder had just happened. Uh, I wasn't thinking straight. Anybody who would witness a scene like that wouldn't have their mind straight. Did I'm you, sure you wouldn't if you were to witness something like that. Did you have your phone with you on um, April 3rd of 2021? Like on me? No, not on me. I left it in my room when I had heard the like the banging in the walls and stuff like that. I had left the, the phone in my bedroom. Okay. But you had your phone in your room? I had the phone in my room, correct. And you had access to your phone on April 4th as well? Uh, access to my phone April 4th, yes. And you did not call 911 on April 3rd? No, ma'am. You did not call 911 on April 4th? No, ma'am. And it's one of the biggest regrets that I have in my life not to call for help. On April 3rd, isn't it true that you had an appointment uh, for a cleaning consultation for your mom's business with a potential client in the middle of the day on April 3rd? Correct. And I had canceled that because of the traumatic events that I had just witnessed. My mom never told me to cancel it. I just went ahead and just texted, hey, we're not going to be able to make it. And that's pretty much it. And then when I told my mom, when I arrived in Clayton, and I told my mom that, I told my mom that the client had texted me. So I kind of like lied to my mom because I didn't want her to find out that of the events that I had just witnessed, they had no idea whatsoever. They're now just hearing it for the first time. Okay, so just to be clear, would you back in 2021 sometimes have kind of intake appointments with potential new clients for your mom's cleaning business? Correct. The business is registered under my phone number and all the business cards are in my phone number and the social media and all the emails are connected to my cell phone. So every single time I would do like marketing on Facebook for her business, uh, you know, we have potential clients who would like send messages and emails and um, I would respond to them or if a client that we already had um, would want to recommend a friend, they would give them my phone number and then that person would, would contact me because I'm the one who speaks English, my mom doesn't speak English. Okay. So I was the one who was, just, who was doing all these kind of things. And so you had one of those potential client appointments on April 3rd, is Correct. that right? Yes. And isn't it true that it was at noon? Somewhere around noon, I guess, I can't remember, but I know we had a potential new client appointment that day and I do recall canceling. 
Okay. You you texted them to say that you could not make it. Something came up. Correct. And isn't it true that you also canceled your shift at the yarn mill that you were supposed to start at 8 p.m. on April 3rd? So that shift, I was not scheduled to work that weekend. So the way we're scheduled at the yarn plant is one one week um, you, you're scheduled to work Monday, Tuesday, you're off Wednesday, Thursday, and you work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then the following week, it's opposite. So you're off Monday, Tuesday, you have to work Wednesday, Thursday, and it's optional to work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so the weekend that the murder occurred, it was optional for me to go. But out of respect, I always like to let the supervisor know, hey, I'm not going to make it. The supervisor told me, you you don't even have to call me if you want to show up um, on, on my shift. You do a really good job at your job. So out of respect, I always like to, you know, advise them, hey, I'm not going to make it. So that whenever we did have their daily meetings where we're, where we're going to be stationed in the plant, they could know, oh, well, Eric's not going to show up, so I'm going to put this other person uh, in this section to pack the yarn. Isn't it true, yes or no, that you contacted that yarn mill and said you were not going to come to work that night? Correct. Because you were sick? Correct. Okay. Kaylee did not cancel her shift at the Ale House that day, did she? No, she did not. She, we saw her leaving on the camera at right. around 9.17. Mm -hmm. She had to work at 10 at the Ale House in Briar Creek. Correct. And she worked from 10 until 5. Sure, I don't remember her schedule, but sure. She And she got home at 5.20. Okay, and she worked until 5 then, yes. Okay. Um, so you were the one that canceled kind of your plans for the day, but mm -hmm. she just goes on to her shift at the Ale House. Yes, and, and that's the one of the things that, as I mentioned in my testimony, that's one of the main things that scared me the most. What scared me the most was how how calm she was. I think that scared me more than the actual murder itself, and that stressed me out, and, and I was just not in my right mind. I can't handle situations like this. Um, I've never been in a situation like this before in my life. So I was just not, I was not doing great that morning. I, I was not feeling well. And so that's why I just canceled everything. And so it looked, so it won't look too suspicious. Kaylee went to work to make it look like, you know, it was a regular day. And I just called off because I was sick. It was all part of a plan that we had um, made up. Okay. So she goes to work that whole day. Correct. And then she also went back to work the next day on Sunday. Correct. And I was planning on going back to work the next day too. Um, when she's leaving in the surveillance video, she doesn't have a bag or anything in her hands at all. Right. Um, how had she cleaned up so fast? I have no idea. I mean, the, the time of death happened, 717, and I remember because I went to my room and looked at my phone at that time, so by the time that she left, there was still like a two hour gap. So you have plenty of time to be able to clean up in two hours, you know, take a shower and stuff like that. It doesn't take you that long to take a shower. So your testimony is that Kaylee went out the night before her work, and, and your your testimony was that she, she got wasted, it sounds like. Yes, I was with them. And and she was throwing up. Yes, correct. And you guys got home shortly after midnight? Yes. Okay. Um, but she woke up early for her shift from the alehouse? No, she woke up because of the banging that Christina had made in my door. That woke Kaylee up. And she was so mad about that that she went into Christina's room to confront her. I have no idea what went on. I don't know if she was still, she was awake earlier than that. But basically what she told me is because it is that she got woken up because of the banging on the door. I'm not 100% sure if she was already awake or not. She may have been awake, I don't know. But that loud banging in the door that Christina had in my door, that's what woke her up. So was it the banging that made Kaylee so upset that she took a knife to Christina's neck? Or was it the muffins? I have, no, I have no idea. I, I can't speak for that. I'm not, I, I can't read somebody's mind. I don't know what her state of mind was at that time. I know that she is a person who, who, who is violent, who is always trying to confront people and fight people. And so um, I know that she has beat up her own mother. And, and you know, it, it, it was a shocking scene for me to see. But, um, uh, you know, it, it was something, it's something that you don't expect. I don't know what was going through her mind. You never know what's going through the other, the other person's mind. I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what her mindset was on. I have no idea what they had going on in the, in the, in the, in the past. I don't know. Okay. All I know is what I saw with my own eyes. Okay. Um, and we'll get to that. 
Um, but ha- did Kaylee owe Christina any money? I have no idea. Did Kaylee ever refer to Christina as her golden ticket? Kaylee? Yes. No. Okay. So she didn't really need her for anything like you needed Christina for. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, but they did fight over things like the thermostat. That I witnessed, yes. And I know they have physically fought before, but I wasn't there to witness it. That was just something that was told to me, so I really can't verify that. Okay. And um, it sounds like we saw a text message of uh, a basketball player slept with Kaylee and then and, and then texted Christina. Yes, I know that they had drama not only over that one basketball player, but they had drama over more guys that, that they knew in common. Me, I just knew about that one basketball player. I don't know all the other people that they had in common because I don't hang around that type of group. So I, I really don't have no idea. But that text message about that basketball player um, was from August of 2020. Isn't that true? Right. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. Sure. Okay. I guess we saw in the evidence. So, um, your testimony is that Kaylee threatened you. Yes, she did. Okay. And you, you believed that threat? Absolutely, I did. Okay. Um, tell us, is she, um, part of any kind of street gang? Mm, I, that I cannot answer. I have no idea. Okay. Does she have any organizations or to any connections to organized crime? Yes, she did have a couple connections. Like, she had this one dude who, who made, like, fake IDs um, that were scammed, that I would actually scan. I had one myself. So that's how, um, when I used to, like, go out with Kaylee to, like, a, let's say, a local burger joint, we, we would ride the electric scooters that would be in downtown, and we would eat there, and then we'd drink a beer using our fake IDs. I know that she also had a plug. Um, where she got like her weed and, and, and she had cocaine because um, she did do cocaine every now and then um, She never really did it in front of me. I don't think she, she only did it once and um, Yeah, so she does have like a couple of connections. She does know a lot of people Okay, and so I guess my my question was like does she have any connections to organized crime or mob activity or anything like that? Mm, I, mean, I, I thought my answer my answer was for that question. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of the drug activity, you have indicated already in your testimony that um, Kaylee did some drugs and, and yes. you, you talked about Christina having people over and you were concerned about drugs in your house. Yes, um, Christina also um, did drugs too. But isn't it true that you all smoked weed together? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, but it was, I didn't do it on a daily basis. I would like, for example, like Kaylee would, would roll a blunt, maybe I'll take like a hit or two every once in a blue moon. It wasn't something that I was addicted to. Me, I like cigarettes a lot more better. So that that was my thing, cigarettes. Um, weed was never, I don't even know how to roll a blunt. I don't even know how to do that. So I, I me, weed wasn't uh, a big thing at all. Was, I, I wasn't, it didn't pay, I wasn't paying attention to that at all. Um, it was just something that I would do with Kaylee or Christina, like on a day off, just to chill out, just to, you know, but it wasn't, but I never went over that. I never did, I never became obsessed with it. Me, I just did cigarettes, that's it. Okay. And I drank. And, and weed. Every once in a while, sure, but me, oh, like me, like, oh, I want to find some weed? No. It would just be if, if Kaylee, if, if I'm with Kaylee and she starts smoking a blunt, I'll, I'll pick some of her blunt too. I have never purchased weed myself. Like, I would just smoke from the blunt that Kaylee would purchase from her plug. So I, I've never, I, I don't have contact with these people at all. Okay, so back to your the threat that Kaylee made to you. Sure. Um, yes, and uh, she doesn't own a gun, does she? I mean, at least at the time, no gun was ever recovered from her room. Right, uh, not that I was aware of, no. Okay. Um, but you were still so afraid of her that ultimately you lied to, to police. Yes, I was. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Can you need to wait till she's finished? Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And so um, were you thinking that you just wouldn't get arrested for this? Is that what you were thinking? I knew that eventually, uh, I knew that eventually I would get arrested for it. I was already 100% sure. That's why I was not doing well. I was waiting for the police to come get me. When I was released from the Texas Division the first time, that was like one of the 
biggest reliefs that I had because I thought I was gonna get arrested then and there. I wasn't fully like I, I, I didn't think I was gonna be able to go like go home or, or get out of the police station at one time. But I knew eventually I was gonna have to get arrested, and you know, I, again, I was not in the right mindset. I mean, I, I it's something that not everybody witnesses in their everyday life. I'm sure you've never witnessed a brutal murder like that ever. So um, words can't explain what I had going on in my mind. And to this day, it's still affecting me a lot. Uh, I take antidepressants. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I've been feeling very depressed lately. Um, in the entire time, in the entire three years that I have been locked up at the Wake County Jail, um, it has affected me a lot too. Um, you know, uh, the whole situation, uh, how I could have gone differently. Um, you know, the, there was a lot of stuff that I that I had to think about um, when I was in here, and um, that threat that, that Kaylee made, I took that personal because, like I mentioned before, if she is the kind of person that beats her mom up to the floor and 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 and, and is the one to threaten other people that she doesn't even know, and, and I witnessed the brutal stabbing that she had on Christina, what makes me think that she wouldn't do that to my own family? If she had no remorse at all after she had murdered Christina, like I said, that's the thing that scared me the most, more than me witnessing the actual murder. But then two days later, on April 7th, you're the one that's being put in handcuffs for the murder of Christina Matos. Isn't that true? That is true because I did not hide the evidence. I did not do a good job at hiding stuff. Um, again, like I mentioned before, I'm not prepared for this. This is not something I plan. This is not something that I thought I would even walk into. Um, but it just happened, and my nerves got to me. I wasn't thinking right. I, you know, I'm not built to do these kind of things. I, I'm not prepared. Uh, I didn't plan any of this. I, you know, it just I just didn't do a good job at cleaning up, and and I admit to that guilt and and. and I will take full responsibility for attempting to clean up and for lying for the police, absolutely. But so, me murdering Christina, I never would murder her. She was my golden ticket, like I mentioned, and I needed her alive more than anybody else. Speaking of doing a bad job cleaning up, um, did you clean up? I mean, ultimately, did you take some of these items and put them in the trash and take them to the trash chute? Yes, I did. And uh, you were the one who put on those gloves and ultimately got Christina's blood on those gloves. Correct. As I was trying to, when, when I moved her body and I was trying to attempt to try to clean up and try to see if there was anything under her, um, that's when um, I, I, I used the gloves so like that, um, like some kind of print wanted to be left behind or... There's yeah. no evidence, is there, that Kaylee participated in cleaning up at all? Is there correct? Because I did not let her go back into that room. I was the only one who had the key. I was the only one who was going to go back in there. But really, I wasn't even attempting to try to clean up because it was my guilty conscience was, was kicking in. Um, I'm sure this is something that Kaylee had planned. So obviously, that's why you know she did a good job at trying to hide her evidence. But me, all I did was I, I just tried to attempt to clean up. You're saying that she did a good job at attempting to hide her evidence, but ultimately there's no evidence that she touched anything relating to the actual crime scene in Christina's room, is there? Mm, not that I recall, but she was there. Um, but she, Kaylee, the real killer, never takes any of the trash to the trash chute. Right, because I was the one who was going to take care of that. I was the one who had... Taking the trash out was never really part of the plan. The plan was for me to try to clean up, and so when I cleaned up, the only way I could think of trying to get rid of these things is throwing it in the trash in the trash can, and that's when I packed it up and threw it out. That was the thing that came in my mind. I didn't think that authorities would ever find it or anything like that. Kaylee never really carries a bag out of the apartment that has any items in it, does she? Not that I recall, no. But you did, in your backpack. Correct. I had my laptop, my iPad in there with chargers, and I had like a couple of books, and along with the um, with the trash bag of my bloodied white shirt, my um, bloodied uh, black pajama pants, and my bloodied pair of socks, and to make my my backpack look like like it was full of books, 
I even put my North Face jacket in there, um, which I was carrying in, um, as well that day. So uh, I wanted to try to make my backpack look full for, for the camera so that if I were to be questioned, um, my backpack wouldn't look so empty, per se. Okay. So, again, when Detective O'Neill was asking you questions, a lot of those things that he told you were not, were, that you told him were not the truth. Uh, I did say, I said truth and lies, but I mean, sure, I guess you could say that. I mean, I, but I did say, I, I was honest about a lot of things. I was just dishonest about when she asked me, when she, excuse me, when he asked me about, you know, the murder, like questions in regards to the murder, like when was the last time I saw Christina, stuff like that, that I did lie to. But to the events to where I was, that I did not lie about. And then um, you're arrested on April 7th. So they actually put you in the handcuffs. They take you to the jail. Is that right? Yes. They put me in handcuffs and chain my feet and chain my waist and connected everything. Um, and, and you're a rule follower, right? You've never broken any laws before. Correct. But even at that point, you don't tell them this story that you just told this jury today, did you? No, because I was in fear of the threat that she put on me. And like I said before, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't in my right mind. Um, it, it is a murder that I, again, uh, witnessed of one of my best friends, the one person who was going to help me move on in life um, by helping me with immigration status. So um, we could say the same thing. For example, if you have your own friend, if you witness somebody, uh, you know, brutally murder your best friend, I'm sure you wouldn't be in the right mind either. And I definitely wasn't in the right mind at all, and I'm admitting to that here so in court today. So after spending seven days in the jail, a week, April 14, 2021, you have spent the night in, in custody uh, for seven nights. At that point, you didn't come forward and tell the real truth at that point either, did you? No, because again, I was still in fear. And then later they vandalized my home, and I took that as a, as a message from Kaylee. So it made me definitely not want to say anything at all. And you didn't come forward after 30 days of, of no, sleeping I did not. in the jail? No, I did not. After one year of sleeping in the jail, you did not come forward? No, I did not. Okay. I came forward after Kaylee got arrested because I felt some kind of safety after she was in custody. Um, I knew that she was in jail and I knew that she wouldn't be able to hurt my family at all. So, 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 when, um, so when Kaylee um, got arrested, uh, that's when I told my, my, my attorneys about the situation. Told your attorneys about the situation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, is Kaylee in custody right now, to your knowledge? I later find out after I had confessed to my attorneys everything that I said. Later on, um, I didn't see them again until... So I confessed to them when Kaylee got arrested around June. And then when I saw them again around, like, September or October... Um, they uh, they told me that she had bailed out from her $2 million bond that she had. Okay. And they came to see me, I think, the day after maybe Kayla was arrested. It was like pretty immediately, like when everything had occurred. So she's not in custody right now? No, she's not in custody. To my knowledge, she is not in custody. I don't have any contact with her at all. To my knowledge, she is out on house arrest on bail. Okay. Um... Um, you've never told uh, this version um, to Detective O'Neill uh, before today, have you? No. The last time I spoke to Detective O'Neill was in that interview video that we saw in court. That was the last time I ever saw him face to face. And um, you've uh, you, you've kind of talked about this case with your attorneys, isn't that true? You, you've talked yes, about that. Yes, I have. And you've read all the reports and all the discovery that there is that the state's provided. I did not have a full discovery at the time. All I had then was just like police reports and like just search warrants and that's pretty much it i didn't have like any further discovery at all um my lawyers never provided that to me uh, because they were afraid that maybe like an inmate in the jail would try to look at my discovery and try to jump in my case or stuff like that so all i had was just like just regular police reports my interview search warrants to my bedroom search warrants to my car that type of stuff 
But later on, um, when I was starting to meet with them more often after I had confessed and everything, they would bring everything and we would go over it in person. And that's when I would find out, at, way after I had already told them the truth. Okay. Photos, videos, things like that. The first time I saw photos and videos is here in the courtroom. I never seen the photos or videos. Um, but I didn't have to see the photos because I knew exactly what the crime scene looked like. Um, so uh, those images really wasn't nothing new, new to me. It was more of traumatic. But um, the interviews, um, I know what I said to the detectives. So again, like I said, it, it's not new to me. Um, but the pictures of like the trash shoe and of them taking pictures of my car and stuff like that, that was the first time I've ever seen pictures of those stuff. Yes, ma'am. Um, so ultimately, you say that you walk into Christina's room um, and you see Kaylee and Christina both on their knees. Kaylee's behind Christina, is that right? Yes, yes ma'am. Just like I, I presented it with my attorney, Will Webb, um, I was the one in Christina's position. He was the one being Kaylee. And so that's exactly how it occurred. That's the exact position they were in when I had walked into the bedroom. And you said the knife was similar to one of those uh, Gibson steak knives that we've seen. It was similar to the one found on top of the fridge, the one that had dust in it. It was almost ex like uh, identical, like same blade, same type of, um, it wasn't a plane, it was, how, how, what's that word? Um, uh, like it had like little, like, like teeth, I don't know how to say, it. I don't know what it's called, but it had like a little texture in the bottom. But yes, it was almost similar to the one found on top of the fridge. Okay. And then uh, you grabbed Kaylee and you threw her towards the entrance of Christina's room. Yes, ma'am. And then what? how did you interact with Christina? So after um, I threw Kaylee towards like the, the door, Kaylee got up and she tried to come to me. And I think as I tried to grab her, she cut me right here in my arm, uh, like a little tiny scratch. Um, it healed pretty well because when I was still out there, um, I, I applied very good ointment. Um, and the only reason the police were not able to see that was because when they were taking pictures of my body, I had my Apple Watch on. So my Apple Watch, bam, hit it. So um, that's what that's where that this cup came from, and, and you can still see the scratch to this day. Um, and so when she tried to come to me, I grabbed her arm and I twisted it and I pushed her right out. I'm 265 pounds; she's like 115 pounds. So it's not hard for me to be able to kick Kaylee out of the room. It was pretty easy. And so once I, I threw her out and I locked the bedroom door, when I locked the bedroom door, I went towards Christina and that's when I laid her down and then I tried to get help but she told me, no, let me die. And then I, I, I held her in my arms. I, I got on the floor, sat on the floor and I held her in my arms until her last breath. And her last words before she went unconscious was, please tell my mom I love her. You said and you, then she died shortly after. You said you held her in your arms. I mean, how were your arms in relation to her body? I held her, so I was sitting on the floor, and I had her like, like I was sitting, I don't even know how to explain it. I was like, with my legs out like this, and I had her like, just leaning towards me, like, just trying to help her out, like trying to hold the bleeding from her neck. But shortly after, she had died. Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes, ma'am. Um, Your Honor, I'm approaching with a photograph from State's Exhibit 42, um, which is uh, Brooke Bale's photos from uh, original day, scene one. Yes, ma'am. Original. Eric, I'm showing you uh, one of the photographs we already saw in this trial um, of State's Exhibit 42, which is uh, Agent Brooke Bale's photographs um, of Chris, Miss, Miss Matos' body. Um, yes, can you kind of, using this, point out kind of where you were when you were holding her? Yes, I was sitting right here, and she was like more up towards me. So I was like holding her in my hands, like right around this area right here. And then when she had died, um, I tried to get her off me, and I just like tried to push her a little bit up front forward. And then um, also, now that you have this picture up, right here, this little dark stain right there, that's where I sprayed bleach, where I attempted to clean up, and I was not successful at doing it. Okay. So, where were she and Kaylee in relation to this photo? They were, like, right here. Right okay. here. And were they, um, were their upper bodies straight up? Were, was somebody down? Tell us about that. So, it was exactly like my attorney and I presented right here in the court. It was just the exact way. I can't remember if she was, like, set up or slouched. I can't remember that. But I know that she was in her knees in that position. Okay. 
What was Christina doing with her hands? With her hands, she was trying. I remember she was trying like to to like grab Kaylee's arms, but obviously her um, Kaylee was like stabbing her. So I guess she was trying to more like try to hold on to the weapon, but she couldn't. So her thing was, I'm guessing that she was just trying to get um, Kaylee off of her. Because when I walked in, I saw Christina's hands trying to get Kaylee off of her, and so that's when I launched towards Kaylee and I grabbed her and I threw her towards the entrance of the door. So that back around here. Yes, ma'am. I, I grabbed her around here and I threw her up to this mm -hmm. um, hallway right here, and that's where she landed. And so then your testimony is you were sitting right here. Yeah, 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 ma'am. So Christina was still on her knees right here. She was still on her knees. And then um, when I had to kick Kaylee out, I grabbed Christina and I kind of like tried to lay her down. And I told her, um, let me go get some help. And she, that's what she told me, no, please let me die. And so that's why I didn't get any help at all. I just stayed there with her. And shortly after, she died within quick minutes. I wasn't even there long. She was gone. And so is your testimony that you were sitting right here? Around right here, somewhere right here, yes ma'am. And what, did she have her head in your lap? Tell us about that. Was she, she had face her, up? She had her, she had her head like right here in my chest. Like I was holding on to her and trying like to hold on to her throat, like, you know, to stop the bleeding. But I was not very successful at it because um, blood was coming out of her mouth too. And it was just a, a horrible scene and experience. So was your back to the wall or was your back were you facing towards the door? I was facing towards that way, that way. So I was sitting right here, facing towards this way. Just like, just how she's positioned, the only difference is that she was a little bit screwed up, like more over here when I had her in my arms. When she had died, that's when I tried like, to scoot her up, and that's why her leg was like a little bit twisted from when I tried to like scoot her up. There wasn't enough space, and then her leg went under the desk, as you see there. Okay. How did these blood stains get over in this area? I'm guessing that's when I heard the loud banging. Um, I'm sure she was trying to fight Kaylee or some, of some sort, and so she was trying to fight. I'm sure she was trying to fight for her life. So that's when where all these things came upon. After I heard her like all like the noises and the thumping in the wall, that's where that's where I'm, I'm guessing that's where those things came from. Okay. Were you wearing shoes or were you not wearing shoes? No, ma'am. I was just wearing white socks. Why did you um, take her phone? I'm sorry? Why did you take her phone? Why did her phone need to go? Paranoia kicked in. I'm think, I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking that uh, I may have been recorded trying to attempt to clean up. So, I don't know. Just paranoia. I don't know, I guess. I, I wasn't thinking. I was just being reckless at that point. Just trying to pick up whatever I could find. And where did you get it? I got it from her bedroom. Okay. When I had attempted to clean up and... Um, the one, one of the, I can't remember which one was the first time or the second time, but I was able to find her phone um, right there. It took me a minute. It was like close to like under her bed, her phone. And you said the first time and the second time. I'm a little confused about how many times you went back in the room. I only went, I, I only attempted to go back clean up twice. Once when um, after post murder, after I had taken a shower and Kaylee had to to work that Saturday morning, um, I went I, I went in the first time. And I already had the key. I unlocked the bedroom door to D, and I entered, and I had a bunch of napkins, and all I did was just pick up fingernails, that's it. And then I threw it in the trash can, and then that's when I threw the trash can, the trash bag out the first time, and I put a brand new back in. And then after I had gone to Clayton and see my mom and eat and go home and do all that stuff, I um, had bought the bleach in the process of throughout my day. I bought the bleach from the Walgreens, and then I went back to the apartment, and then I put, the first thing I put in the washer was my black pajama pants. Obviously, I didn't use bleach. I just used detergent. And so I pressed start and I just left it alone. It was the only item in the washer. And so then I went to my room and I remember that I have some gloves. We don't have any latex gloves at home at the apartment. So the, the only thing that I had that I could think of is my work gloves. And so that's when I grabbed my work gloves and then I went back the second time. And that was the last time I ever went back um, into Christina's bedroom. And that dark stain that I showed you in the wall, that's where I sprayed with bleach, attempted to try to wipe it, but I saw that it wasn't possible for me to do. I was just not um, prepared to do anything like this. I was just scared of the threat that Kaylee had put on me. 
And that's the only thing I could ever think of that day. It was the day that Christina got murdered and I was just not thinking straight. All I, all I was thinking about is this girl could hurt my family if I don't try to attempt to clean up. And then when she asked me if I had cleaned up, all I said was, yes, everything's done. But really, I, I, I didn't feel comfortable doing any of that stuff. I had a dead body right in front of me. I was not doing well. And that's when I left the bedroom. We're going to stop for the day. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please do not express an opinion. Do not form an opinion. Do not do the investigation. Do not go to any location that's been mentioned. Um, once again, do not watch the news. I want you to return promptly tomorrow morning at 9.30 so that we can continue with our work. Everyone else remain seated while the jury leaves the courtroom. Go leave your pens and pads in their chairs. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow. Yeah.